Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's Monday, January 9th, 2012. Now, coming up in the broadcast, we have Greg Hunter of usawatchdog.com on a host of issues. But, of course, we have plenty of news before that. Now, we know this is a kept nation. We know all the rules are broken. We know wars are planned and politics is rigged. But is now the time for the Iran war? There are a number of troubling indicators. And Kurt Nemo has issued an alert to look out for World War III. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot of reason to believe that. Here in this busy graphic, you can see some of the indicators. War in the Middle East now appears imminent as the U.S., Britain, the European Union, and Israel put the finishing touches on an embargo against Iran, a de facto declaration of war with warships steaming toward the Persian Gulf. But that's not all. Of course, we have the recent U.S.-Israeli war games in the Persian Gulf. We have Iran with its war games, an announcement of more war games, including to shut down the Strait of Hormuz. We have Britain sending in warships. We already have Russian warships in the area, French and Russian warships off the coast of Syria, according to Depka file. And we have the statements from Ron Paul that sanctions are the first step towards war. Now, is he right? Let's listen to the quote. Sanctions were the first step in our wars against Iraq and Libya, and now more sanctions planned against Syria and Iran are leading down the same destructive path Ron Paul warned. But of course, no one wants to listen to Ron Paul when there's a war they could have, so they'll probably be leaning towards a kept political uh, puppet. Oil prices are also rising along with tensions, now headed towards 113 a barrel, and many experts predict the prices could be well over 200, 250, 300, even 500 if the Strait of Hormuz was blocked or if a war went hot. Of course, there's a whole covert war against Iran going on in the background. Why? Because there's a hit list against Iran. It's on the globalist hit list. The question was how and when, not why or if there would be a war with Iran. So that's why I stress, is this the time? Now, you also have the Iranian missile-based propaganda. You see that today in the Associated Press. Iran nuke work at Bunker is, quote, confirmed. Diplomats on Monday confirmed a report that Iran has been begun uranium enrichment at an underground bunker. And the news is particularly worrying because the site is being used to make material that could be upgraded more quickly for use in nuclear weapon than the nation's main enriched stockpile. Is this true? I don't know, but you certainly have to question the timing along with other reports that Aminajad's visit to South America could be tied to long range missiles and more. You could smell it in the air. War is brewing somewhere. Will they actually kick it off? You saw a lot of propaganda several years ago uh, in 06 for the Iranian war. It didn't happen then because so many people were warning against it happening. So I hope our warning here again and can make them back off another time because, again, we know they're in the crosshairs. Nobody wants a World War III that won't be good for anyone except the bankers. Of course, you also have the Russian naval flotilla docked in Syria with uh, an undermining effort, of course, going on in Syria as well. Al-Qaeda operatives and others uh, staging the coup in that country on top of everything else. The port call is aimed at bringing the two countries closer together and strengthening ties of fit, uh, friendship. The official SANA news agency quoted a Russian naval officer concerning their ships outside of Syria. Meanwhile, you have the rig political game as the Republican primaries are underway the first official primary vote tomorrow in New Hampshire on the heels of the Iowa caucus, uh, where Ron Paul finished third but had an essentially uh, st uh, statistical tie for first in terms of the delegates that were won at that uh, event. Now, the whole deal leading into New Hampshire is we see a brand new wave of prostitute interruptions and circus and media claims of... Uh, putting Ron Paul in a bad light just the day before the vote with him in second place. First of all, you have this incident earlier that you're seeing video of 
where the cameras surrounded Ron Paul uh, when he was at a meet and greet. He was supposed to meet New Hampshire primary voters. Instead, they packed the house with a bunch of uh, high school students from Massachusetts, and the press gang wouldn't allow him to reach the voters. Then when he left, the media spun it and tried to act as if it was Ron Paul refusing to reach out to voters. One woman in particular became irate, started uh, screaming at Ron Paul and claiming he had promised to meet with their mother. Apparently, uh, some reports indicate a staffer or something Thing had had given the woman reassurances. Ron Paul himself wasn't in position to talk to these people and pretty much had to leave the event. But that didn't stop The Hill from saying media mob chases Ron Paul from campaign stop in New Hampshire uh, and quoting heavily from a French candidate who shouted at Ron Paul, uh, called him a demon, said, we have you surrounded. We are the media. Uh, a man wearing a boot on his head and dressed as a wizard, according to some reports. Uh, meanwhile, the New York Times reports in the caucus that Ron Paul cut off CNN again uh, about a week and a half ago or so. You saw a contrived report where Ron Paul supposedly stormed out of a CNN interview where they asked about the newsletters. Uh, they, you know, edited the tape to their own liking to put him in a bad light. Now, again, from this event this morning where he was surrounded by the press, Dana Bash from CNN was supposedly a few feet away, and Ron Paul essentially became angry and refused to give an interview, though he did apparently give an interview to Fox News. Then you have CBS today, another of the branch of prostitutes, who blatantly excluded Ron Paul from their coverage, showing a new poll from Suffolk University where they accidentally, for the 50th time, omitted Ron Paul from poll results in these prostitute media channels, the so-called mainstream media. They show Ron Paul with a hefty 43% lead and then Gingrich, Hutzman, and Santorum all in single digits. Now, they are trying to anoint Mitt Romney, as many have pointed out, but they also presumably want to keep Ron Paul's name out of the headlines so he's not able to gain momentum because he's the only anti-war candidate. And as we've just shown you, they're gearing up for a war big time, and you know Obama, Romney, or any other creature is only going to back up that war, whatever they may say publicly. Now we have a clip from CBS regarding how he was left out of the poll. I am really here for one reason and one reason only. And that is to make sure that we make Mitt Romney the next president of the United States of America. And Expectations are high in what has become Romney's adopted home state. A new Suffolk University poll shows him with a commanding lead in New Hampshire at almost 30 points above his rivals. At the same time, Newt Gingrich and John Huntsman have faltered. Rick Santorum, who polls in single digits here, is looking to give Romney a run in the Granite State after his near victory in Iowa. And of course, it's no surprise not only to see them leaving Ron Paul out of it, but to seeing aging flip-floppers uh, who support war like John McCain supporting people like Romney. Now, we're all going to be watching on this Diabolt thing because in 2008, there were a lot of really unaccounted for swings. Uh, for instance, Hillary Clinton ended up winning in 2008 by 3%, even though she was down 13% in the polls, an unexplained 16-point swing. Uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani got more votes than he probably should have, and Romney really got a boost in 2008 in New Hampshire from the Diabolt voting machines. Of course, Ron Paul himself uh, got zero votes in Sutton County, uh, which they recorded until people came forward and said they voted for him. Uh, they later had to admit that they omitted 31 votes from that little area and said, oh, it was human error, uh, one of those things that just happened. So we're all going to keep an eye on it tomorrow and see what happens because I don't think they want the snowball effect for the Ron Paul campaign for some reason, he's just not allowed to win in 2012. Meanwhile, in true occultic fashion, there was a secret White House party in 2009, a secret Alice in Wonderland bash for Halloween during the recession. Now, they had a much more humble Halloween festivity that was covered by the media uh, with school children that day uh, from the Washington area. But then after that, they had a secret party hosted by Tim Burton and Johnny Depp, where they dressed up like the characters from the Alice in Wonderland uh, film, and they drank blood vials filled with fruit punch at the bar, and the whole thing was very macabre, and, and the children of Obama were there, and everything. It was a very plush party, all while the White House were nervous 
that the party might be covered in the press because a splashy Hollywood party would look strange to jobless Americans while, uh, well, you know, while the whole recession was going on and the economy was tanking and people were worried just about making ends meet all while people were having fun in the White House. But I'm sure that's the least of it. But nonetheless, an interesting story there with the Mad Hatter and all. Scientists create silkworm spider hybrid that spins super strong silk. Of course, we've already reported on spider goats, genetically modified goats with spider silk put in them. Now they have genetically modified silkworms spliced in with the stronger spider silk. Uh, scientists have used genes from spiders to create a new type of silkworm that could spin extra tough si silk. Spider genes were injected into silkworms, making them spin spider silk stronger than still a group of biologists have created a new type of genetically modified silkworm capable of spinning extra strong, strong silk spider-man style now the problem here is things are going to get carried away really quickly we also had this report this week of the monkeys created from six different parents spliced together chimeras uh, you also had the army ants uh, where they re-engineered the already existing DNA to create new super ants with giant heads. And that's just the stuff they talk about publicly as they talk about creating human-animal hybrids to harvest clones from and a whole lot more. Who's watching this? Is anyone regulating this for potential dangers or is it just all to make body armor silk for the military industrial complex because spiders can't be handily bred because they are too aggressive to each other in captivity? Well, something to think about, and we'll continue to watch that in the future. Meanwhile, a story on the New Jersey mayor who wants to pay you $1,000 to report illegal guns and destroy the Second Amendment. Brandon Smith of Alt Market reports, there's nothing more disgusting or detestable than a citizen informant. Without citizen informants, tyrants could never retain the kind of power they wield. In fact, without citizen informants, totalitarian movements would never gain traction. But of course, this is why every fun functional oligarchy throughout history has implemented programs designed to encourage the development of common spies using the promise of mon monetary reward or collective recognition. An innocent man dis who's disarmed by law will always be victimized by an outlaw who is armed through criminality. Now, the concept of reduced crime through gun confiscation is so naive it warrants considerable analysis. Through such efforts, good men are left defenseless while evil men are free to wreak havoc. Those are the words of Brandon Smith at Alt Market, good writer. He also adds, the Second Amendment is not a negotiable or debatable pillar of the Constitution. It is absolute in its protection, and yet all these city mayors try to break down the Second Amendment and use excuses like violence uh, created through other economic means to disarm the public and encourage this turning in of people who might have illegal guns, of turning in these guns for gift certificates, and a whole lot more. Of course, this particular mayor, uh, Corey, I think his name was, this video is from a couple years ago, but it certainly illustrates a larger trend because they have hundreds of these mayors recruited in these programs to combat urban violence and, and call for a reigning in of guns and promote the atmosphere as though guns were already illegal, when of course they're not. Now, another very curious case is the missing woman found in the Queen's estate in Sandringham, believed to be murdered, and they've now identified her after a week and a half or so of refusing to identify the woman. They believe it is now Latvian Alyssa Dimitri. Dimitra Jeeva, 17 years old, uh, from Wisbeck in Cambridgeshire, which is very near to the Queen's estate there. Uh, her and her family immigrated from Latvia uh, pretty recently, and it's all very curious, especially since you've got uh, people like the so-called overzealous stalker of the royal family being found, his remains only a few months ago near Buckingham Palace. You have all the suspicion and a pretty strong case for what happened with Princess Diana. Now, who knows what happened with this woman missing uh, and then found murdered months later in the Sandringham estate. But there are a number of curious things that we want to look at here. Uh, first of all, you've got Detective Chief Inspector Jess Fry uh, dismissing speculation that the victim had a drug problem or could have been working in the sex trade. Uh, could she have been brought to the area for some kind of eyes wide shut party? We have no way of knowing at this point, but we do have a 
contradictory report from what the detective chief is saying because the mother went on record in this article, I'm 80% to blame, says distraught mother of Latvian girl in royal estate murder mystery, saying she had been fighting with the girl, she wouldn't live at home, she dramatically changed her personality after moving to the UK, she was arrested in April for stealing with a group of friends, then in June or July she said her friends led her into other worrying habits saying she did, in fact, start taking drugs, and the mother says she knew about it, even though the detective here is saying there's no reason to believe she was involved in drugs or the sex trade. Who knows at this point, of course, but that's not all. We also have the question of why was the body not found for months when the girl went missing in late August uh, through September 2011. We have the fact that the Queen's own people were combing the estate in the fall throughout the months of October and November. Killer dog disease returns to Sangringham, a mystery seasonal illness that could kill dogs has returned to the Queen's estate. And it goes on to discuss how uh, they don't know what causes the diseases, but the Queen herself was so worried she personally requested an Animal Health Trust veterinary investigation. They put up signs warning the public not to bring their dogs in the area and basically they were investigating the very plots of land where this woman was later found months later. So why didn't they find the woman, even though the queen and the other royals continue to have their dog hunts, all these dogs coming over the area, why didn't they find the body? It's certainly a question worth bringing up. And then you have the fact that the queen herself solved the mystery of the killer dog bug, which affected dogs at Sangringham in early December, December 6th here in this uh, Daily Mail article uh, calling off the search and saying it's essentially safe to go back in the area, which is partially open to the public, but of the larger estate owned by the royal family, where, of course, they point out they continue to have hunts despite this disease, and they point out how the queen's cute little dogs weren't affected. But the point is, people were investigating those plots of land, and dogs were on the land. It was, of course, a body eventually found by a dog owner in the public who is walking through the area. So just more questions remain and we'll continue to look at it. No reason yet here to connect it to the royal family, but odd that this body was found on the royal estate there in Sandringham. Now we'll be back after this break with Greg Hunter to discuss all the political events going on. Uh, but I do want to remind you of our Prison Planet TV specials. We need your support. Go check them out at prisonplanet.tv. You can preview the site there and all it has to offer. And just help us get the word out about this broadcast. We want to grow this platform and reach more people. We want to hire more reporters. We want to up the production value even more. You've seen all the wonderful graphics we brought you, the great crew we already have. And we want to up that game another level. So please help us to do that if you believe in our mission here at InfoWars Nightly News. Stay tuned. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there, InfoWars.com. And we are back on the InfoWars Nightly News. We're joined now by Greg Hunter. His website, usawatchdog.com, has been one of, become one of the leading alternative news websites. He covers the spectrum, of course. We'll talk about everything from Ron Paul to the economy to Iran tensions today. Uh, he is neither Democrat nor Republican, liberal or conservative, and he's worked more than nine years as a reporter and uh, assistant to various mainstream media, including ABC News, Good Morning America, CNN, and plenty of others. Greg, thanks for joining us now. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So what do you think is most important uh, in the cycle right now? They've, you've got this article here on the unemployment statistics, but there's plenty more going on. 
Well, let's start with the uh, what's going on up in um, uh, with the campaign and the the GOP. I mean, in Iowa, you know, you've covered this already, but they, uh, you know, there's some tomfoolery and some shenanigans with you know trucks that are uh, missing out of Ames, which is where uh, you know a lot of young people are. Which Ron Paul gets about half of those, and they had you know Carl Rove announcing before anybody else could announce who was going to win and by a small margin. And you know, I, I, this is like a Tom Clancy uh, novel. And I started thinking, why, why would they do that? And I started thinking, you know, if, if they did, and I can't prove it, but boy, there sure are some, some really uh, questionable things that went on in Iowa. I think they just it changed, uh, they just, they just changed the tone of everything. They wanted to make sure that Romney had somebody to run against. And boy, they sure can't have him run against Ron Paul. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what they did was they gave him somebody to run against in Santorum. And now look what's going on up in uh, New Hampshire. What, in a lot of polls, he's finishing near the bottom or at the bottom, Santorum. All of a sudden, he went from you know, first to worst. And uh, I just think that, uh, that it's just you know, what's been going on, and not just uh, the Republicans. I mean, if you look at the mainstream media last week after the uh, Iowa caucuses, you had the uh, early show on CBS, and they talked about a poll, and uh, they had, uh, you know, a Romney and uh, a Gingrich, Huntsman, Santorum, and when you add up all their poll numbers, it came up to 65%. Duh. And they didn't even talk. They talked about Michelle Bachman, who dropped out. They didn't even talk about Ron Paul, who is at least in second place by a pretty wide margin. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, yeah, I think, and I have a theory on that. My theory is, listen, if they, if they did, the mainstream media helped Obama get elected, and I think, I think they did. And I think they did it by what they omitted. And, you know, we heard all about Jenna Bush and the Bush girls and their drinking and George Bush when he was running and he played hooky from the military and what he did and what he didn't do. We didn't hear anything about Obama. We didn't hear they had a brother in Africa or he went to school in Malaysia and he studied, uh, you know, in a Muslim school. Uh, And I'm not going to sign on to the, you know, the birther thing. I think he was born in Hawaii. But what I'm saying is there's a lot about Obama we didn't even find out about. Why? When we found out about all this stuff with, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, Bush you know, 43 uh, when he was running for office. And uh, I just think that the whole uh, mainstream media, if they're liberal leaning, uh, and I think liberal and conservative both do not want to run against Ron Paul. They well, don't want to run absolutely against because, because both sides of the fence have been omitting him, admittedly, from graphics, refusing to cover even where he polls in major mainstream polls. And as you pointed out, the fact he's leading in second in New Hampshire, and now they're trying to prop up like shark teeth uh, other candidates once the formerly major candidates dropped out or lost their steam. And now you've got it, it, Huntsman this, they're coming up with. Well, this, he spent, Huntsman did spend legitimately a lot of time there. He spent more there, uh, according to uh, reports and other people. So I would imagine he would get a, uh, you know, a bump up. But it's a but small I, state with very few delegates, and obviously, uh, as you pointed out as well, they're trying to anoint Romney and more so marginalize Ron Paul, even as he had he would otherwise be able to gain momentum in those major media. Well, I think they're scaring for a, for a couple of reasons. Both parties, both Democrats, Republicans, the Romneys and the Obamas, which that may be what it ends up being, they're scared of him because he gets but half the young people. They're energized. These people care about what's going on. The other thing I think is I think Ron Paul would get a lot of disgusted liberals because, you know, a liberal is not going to vote for Romney. But Ron Paul, who says, well, I don't think we ought to be doing all these wars. Hey, I think that, uh, you know, in the debates, he says, I think that if you want to talk about racism, look at the court system. You know, uh, minorities are disproportionately uh, accused of crime and convicted of crime than their white counterparts in the drug world. Half uh, about, you know, as many whites as blacks are, uh, are drug users, but yet disproportionately black people and minorities are convicted and, uh, and sentenced to death for certain crimes at a much higher rate. Yeah. And so I think that if you look at uh, somebody like uh, Obama and he's looking at Romney or Paul, he's saying, oh, please give me Romney. I mean, he's not going to bring up the banking crisis. He's not going to bring out the bailouts. I mean, you know, Romney, hey, corporations are people too, man. <laughs> and I think if you look at both sides of the issue and the CBS thing, listen, they spend a lot of money on these morning shows. This is not just a misspelled word in a graphic or they were talking about somebody without their picture. They omitted him. They talked about somebody who dropped out of the race, Michelle Bachman, and they didn't talk about the number two contender and that and the number 
two contender by eight votes in Iowa was Santorum. And he's almost in last place or is in last place in, in, in many polls. That, that's unbelievable. That's outrageous. Well, it's if it was the first crazy. time it happened, maybe it could have been a coincidence, but it's happened dozens of times on all the oh, different networks, yes. and now it's yeah, the day got, before the voting. They got cartoons out. You know, there's one famous, one I, I think a pretty a telling cartoon. It's a guy with a camera, and his lens goes up, over, down. A guy, a, you know, a caricature of Ron Paul, and Ron Paul's like, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> they said, you just look past him. And, uh, you know, what, what the country needs, you will not fix uh, the unemployment situation, in my humble opinion, without fixing the financial system and the banks. You can't have the banks have phony accounting. You can't be with the continued bailout. We gave Bank of America last year a uh, $200 billion in forgiveness and debt taken off their books. $200 billion. One bank, Bank of America, last year through Fannie and Freddie. Not a word about that. You'll hear the people at on Fox uh, News and Fox Business, Solyndra, five hundred million. <gasps> somebody should be in jail, and they're right. Somebody should be in jail. But the last quarter, we gave away through Fannie and Freddie two hundred billion. Excuse me, twenty billion dollars, and it's been documented or been alleged. in, uh, for example, the Attorney General in Massachusetts, Coakley, who is alleging five banks committed fraud and mortgage fraud. Where did this stuff end up? Fannie and Freddie. Their uh, SEC is uh, suing former heads of Fannie and Freddie for fraud. Where this stuff ended up in Fannie and Freddie. Why we're not prosecuting bankers for wanton fraud? I'll never know. And I think, well, I do know. I think it's because they're afraid if they start prosecuting these guys, they'll crash the system. According to William Black, who is a professor of economics and law and former banking regulator during the RTC crisis, he says this is 70 times bigger than the SNL, SNL crisis, 70 times bigger. And back then they had 10,000 indictments. They had a, more than 1,000 successful prosecutions, not of clerks, of of. Uh, uh, you know, financial elites, including a sitting governor of a state in Arkansas. And what do we have this time? Zero. We do have Obama on 60 Minutes with Steve Cross, uh, Croft at the uh, beginning of uh, December saying, oh, you know, I think they uh, they didn't they did unethical things, but they didn't they didn't do anything illegal. Oh, really? They didn't do anything illegal. They packaged liar loans. They uh, they uh, they put them into a security and they knew they were liar loans. They rated them as equal to a treasury when they were toxic. And they, we have an ongoing foreclosure crisis where they forged documents so they could go in and take the house. They didn't do anything illegal. Hmm. Uh, outrageous. And Steve Croft, who's supposed to be, you know, the cutting edge of journalism, he doesn't know to say, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Well, at the very least, Croft could have said, with all deference to the president, well, what unethical thing do you think they did? But Nothing. Just a free pass to say whatever you want to 12 million people, to 60 Minutes audiences. That's the reason why we have what's going on is that, as you guys know, InfoWars, which I'm glad you guys are out there, is because we don't have a fair and impartial media. Thank goodness for the Internet. I hope they don't shut it down. I mean, it's well beyond a lack of fair and balanced coverage. It's the system propping up this illusion, whether it's in the economic realm, the voting realm. I mean, what is the real reason they're not interested in fixing the real problems, but just selling us on lies that things are getting better? I mean, you see it in your article today with the unemployment statistics, but it's, it's systematic. Well, the uh, unemployment statistics is just this is, is one of the many uh, ways they basically they they go to academia. Academia says, oh, you're doing unemployment wrong. Really, you need to cut out this and this and this. You need to seasonally adjust that. And really, the unemployment rate is 8.5%. But if you did an unemployment the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics did it in 1994 and earlier, this is according to John Williams at ShadowStats.com, the real unemployment, the true unemployment rate, the way it was done in 94 or earlier is 22.4%. Mm -hmm. That's unemployed, underemployed. And if you look at economists like John Williams, who sells his information, not just to you know, readers like me or just to John Q. Public, but he basically has been in bread and butter, and his client list is secret, but it's uh, hedge funds, big money people. Nobody would ever make a decision, uh, a money decision, based on uh, information uh, derived by the BLS, by GDP or by uh, unemployment numbers, where we're heading. Um, uh, you know, nobody would ever, and they don't. Trust me, they do not. And, uh, you know, John Williams says we're doing nothing more than bottom bouncing uh, and the, you know, the economy is in a severe town downturn. And, you know, the, that's the other thing that, that these numbers, the unemployment, oh, eight, only 8.5 percent. That means like, you know, 92 and a half percent of people uh, or, uh, you know, uh, or excuse me, 91 and a half percent of people are working. Well, not true. 
And that doesn't even account the people that took a less job full time that took a 20% pay cut. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about Bill Gross. Bill Gross, who is the head of PIMCO, and they have $1.3 trillion dollars under management. And Bill Gross talks about, uh, you know, that there's, that, that there's uh, you know, what's happening in the uh, financial markets and economy is like cancer, and it could uh, basically, uh, you know, rearrange economic life as we know it. Uh, but he's referring to, uh, you know, some sort of meltdown. He closes his 2012 preview, and I got I to read this, uh, you know, just the way he said it. He, this is his last line in his 2012 preview, and this is a guy that manages 1.3 trillion dollars of money uh, financial markets and global economy are at great risk this is his preview of 2012 and my uh, questioning is what does he say to his friends and family uh you know buy gold uh you know stock up on water uh, bandages medicine i mean you know that's bearish isn't even a word for it. it's 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 doomsday it's gloomy and this is a guy with a lot of money under management and if you take a look at Jim Rogers, who cavalierly said recently, just after the first of the year on CNBC, and I love the European edition of CNBC. It's much better than the American version. They're, you're likely to learn a lot more on the European version. And Rogers, you know, he was talking about how they're going to make us feel good in Europe, and they're going to you know, extend some more money. And they're actually loaning money. They're adding debt for the debt crisis. They're not really uh, you know, writing any debt down. Nobody's taking any losses. And he says, but, you know, uh, come, you know this is going to be disastrous for all of us. And come, uh, you know, the end of 2012, fall of 2012, I'd be very worried. And he's not the only one making these dire predictions at the end of 2012. And forget the Mayan calendar. The math of the economy is not good at the end of 12 or the beginning of 13. Ray Dalio at Bridgewater Associates, uh, you know, a few months ago, this kind of got swept aside, was that uh, he said that he, he thinks uh, he's got $80 billion, $100 billion under management. This is a big money guy. And he thinks there'll be another collapse at the end of 12 or beginning of 13. Hmm, just like Jim Rogers. And, uh, you know, he predicted the last collapse in 08. Pretty right on the money. And this one will be far worse, according to people like Nassim Taleb, uh, Peter Schiff, uh, you know, multiple people. And this is like yeah, a blue pill world of the Matrix. People are just, you know, plugged in with something in the back of their head. Uh, just, you know, watching American Idol and watch it taping their uh, favorite TV shows. It's unbelievable. Well, what will the Iran war do if that kicks off, just economically speaking, when oil prices are driven up, uh, you know, above the threshold? Well, I think they're, they're telegraphing they're going to have war and it's going to be OK and they don't want the price of oil to spike. And why I say that is because it just came out just this, uh, just recently, last few days, that uh, Saudi Arabia, who wants the United States to drop a daisy cutter on Iran's head. Uh, and we just sold them, what, $60 billion with an F-15 uh, fighter jets, right? Big, big, a uh, big sale of uh, uh, defense equipment, you know, uh, actually offensive equipment. It could be defensive, but offensive, a fighter jet. And so, um, but they said that they're going to have other routes for their oil so that it won't be cut off. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, they got all these uh, Yemeni uh, Al-Qaeda fighters, uh, you know, uh, south of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, Iran has had a lot of time to think about this. No, their Navy is no match for the U.S. Navy. But they're going to have a say, asymmetrical warfare. What's going to happen to insurance rates of tankers? If they say any tanker we see, the United States may be able to get some ships through. But any mm -hmm. tank, any ship we can, we can put C4 on, under the hull, you take a speedboat with an RPG and fire it into the, uh, uh, you know, the, the cabin, uh, you know, whatever we can do to slow this down. Could you imagine the insurance rates on tankers? If there is full blown, we're going to shut down all the traffic we can. Try to take whatever oil you can somewhere else. This is an immense, enormous amount of oil, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be very secretive to where they take this pathway, you know, to get it out through the Red Sea or, you know, so it can go up through the Suez Canal, but that's going to be tough. That's that. I think the price of oil could be eight or nine, uh, you know, the price of gas could be eight or nine bucks a gallon. And, in, you know, in the 90s, we could take this hit. Uh, in the 70s, we could take this hit. Now, we have four banks, just four banks, with $235 trillion in derivatives. Do you think all those derivative contracts will be uh, bilaterally netted and hedged out and settled perfectly if we go to war? Do you think all those contracts in Europe with the sovereign debt will do just hunky-dory dandy in the trillions of dollars? I say no. 
Uh, what happens if China jumps in? That's the other thing. It's not going to be just us against Iran. I think Russia jumps in. China has said on state television that they would uh, come to Iran's assistance, even if it meant uh, World War III. Yeah. Now, that wasn't an official position, but it came out on China state-run television. I think China, that, that's got a big problem. Yeah, obviously, World War III is a scenario that could play. I mean, Syria and all the other chessboard oh, pieces. Oh, yeah. It's Santorum was talking about, we're going to degrade those systems. And I wanted David Gregory to say, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. So you're willing to risk World War III? And, you know, the military generals, a lot of the generals and uh, admirals in the Navy, they, ooh, they think bad juju. They think this is a bad idea. And it is a bad idea because you unloose, uh, unleash the dogs of war. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, really, you don't know the wild cards are going to happen. It will not go according to plan. It will not go as, and I listen, I'm as American as can be. But if this thing gets out of hand and it doesn't go perfectly, and I don't see how it can, uh, that uh, yeah, I think it could crash the world economy. And that's the black swan. That's a flock of black swans. That is the uh, wild card of wild card. I've been calling it. Well, how long Hunter, do you think the American economy and the European economy, uh, you know, with a gasoline here at uh, nine dollars to eight dollars a gallon, if you get it, or fifteen or sixteen euros to the to the liter or or to the to the gallon over in the European, how long do you think those economies will last with sky high gasoline and fuel prices? Yeah. Well, in closing, I, Greg Hunter, very long. tomorrow is the New Hampshire primary vote. Do you think people should be watching for voter fraud? Are they trying to keep Absolutely. Ron Paul's I name out of the headlines? Get on it. You know, they're the Granite State. They don't, they, you know, the, I'll tell you a very unusual statistics uh, that I heard, and that is the best funded candidate up in uh, New Hampshire does not always win. In fact, it's fact it's kind of a rare thing. They don't always win. There's been huge surprises in New Hampshire. And so, yes, I think you ought to watch about voter fraud. At least it, with this one, the people are voting for the candidate. It's a primary instead of, you know, the, the caucus goers are voting for uh, other people who are going to vote for the candidate. In this case, it's the direct vote by New Hampshire to the candidates, and we'll see how it goes. Right. Well, Greg Hunter, we'll speak to you again soon, I'm sure. Thanks for joining us. And that is it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Don't forget about our specials for PrisonPlanet.tv. You can sign up at a discount and support this broadcast. But if you're not sure, you can take a look, preview the PrisonPlanet.tv for free, see all the things we offer. Please check it out. We need your support to get the word off and uh, save this republic. Thank you and good night.